All right. Good afternoon, everyone, or almost afternoon in the Pacific time. I am here in Washington, D.C., uh, and it is hot and humid. I know that in Arizona, it can get really, really hot, but I've been to Flagstaff one time where it was near freezing, and certainly up in the mountains, you are not getting the temperature that Phoenix is witnessing, which could be beneficial for your market, uh, as some of the wealthier people living in Phoenix may want to have that little second home uh, out in a little cooler place. Uh, one major difference between where you are and where I am, because I went to check the temperature, uh, is that in the evening, here it doesn't cool off, but in Flagstaff, it cools off down to 60, so you could actually open the window, but here, because of the humidity, uh, evening temperature 78, so there is a, a climate advantage, uh, is certainly in your area, uh, which is all uh, good for uh, real estate. Well. Thanks for inviting. Uh, I wish I was there in person. Again, the temperature being a little better there uh, than here. Uh, but we are all concerned about the real estate market condition. From this time last year, you saw slower sales, slower sales, and it looked pretty tough towards the year end. Then the first quarter, second quarter, which we recently completed, things are not yet picking up. So home sales are down, it's impacting your business. But incredibly, your clients, your past clients are all happy. They are saying my home values are still way above from the time which I purchased, certainly much higher compared to three years ago. Uh, so your clients are happy. They're locked in on those 3% mortgage rates and they are saying, oh, I am very happy. Maybe something you should consider in terms of calling them, reminding them, or just saying hello, because your past clients are happy uh, and you want to associate that happiness with your service uh, that you provided so that on their next transaction, or maybe they have a friends and colleagues who wants to make transaction, uh, they can refer it over to you. But your business is down. So your clients may be happy, but your business is down uh, because of falling sales activity. All this part, I explain better with PowerPoint slide. So let me put that onto the screen and go from there. So hold one second as I do that. All right, so I am in this mode. So let's first look at why sales are much lower now compared to before. And we know higher mortgage rates, which was brought about from the Federal Reserve interest rate policy. This graph shows what was the policy pre-COVID in 2019. So it starts from 2019. Then in the middle, you see essentially zero. That is the COVID zero interest rate policy. Great panic, great uncertainty. Federal Reserve wants to assure that the economy did not, want, did not collapse. So they went all in. Maximum monetary stimulus, including zero interest rates. Zero interest rate is not for you and me. It's for the banking system. But hopefully through the banking system, it filters so the mortgage rate decline, and it did. Mortgage rate at one point reached 3% or slightly lower, and some people were able to lock in those rates. Uh, congratulations to those uh, uh, home buyers or homeowners who refinance into, and perhaps you also did it. Uh, so those were great rates. But as you can see from 2022, Fed began to raise interest rates. Then again, 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 again. Only the last meeting, they took a pause, meaning they did not raise interest rates. Next week, they're meeting again. Unfortunately, all indication is that there will be another rate hike next week with a possibility of one more before stopping permanently. So Fed has pursued this most aggressive interest rate hike policy since the early 1990s, early 1980s, I should say. 
back in the early 1980s, uh, from aggressive interest rate policy, mortgage rate actually hit 18%. To somewhat, thankfully, this time we're not seeing 8%, but 7% mortgage rate still hurts after experiencing about 3% mortgage rates. So this policy of tightening, raising interest rates is really flipping uh, the home sales activity from a boom to much, much softer conditions. So why did the Fed raise interest rates? Well, one of the Federal Reserve mandate, or you can say, why does the Federal Reserve exist? Who created it? What kind of authority do they have? They were created essentially to say, let's assure that the dollar is a dollar. It does not lose value. For example, Mexican pesos would have lost value over time. So one of the job of the Federal Reserve is to say, let's make sure inflation is under control. Dollar would be dollar. And of course, we always had some level of inflation, so dollar always lose some degree of value, even though it holds up relatively well compared to many other currencies. But uh, in 2019, pre-COVID or under normal circumstances, inflation will be running around 2%. But look what happened in 2021, 2022, or exactly this time last year when inflation was running 9%. You went to the gas station, painful. You went to the grocery store, frustrating. Uh, everything seemed very, very expensive. So the so the high inflation is the reason why the Fed is raising interest rates. It is their job. It is their job to contain inflation. And in a sense, they were one step or two step late in terms of trying to contain the inflation. So that's why they pursued this aggressive policy. But the good news is that look towards the end of this graph. It is coming down. Inflation is much calmer. In fact, the most recent data, which I forgot to include it in this graph, is showing 3% inflation. So prices are rising about 3% above one year ago, almost back to the desired inflation rate, which means that the Federal Reserve should not be raising interest rates. In fact, next week when they raise interest rate, I'm going to make a remark to say this is a terrible mistake because I will go into more logic as to why that's the case. But there's no reason the Fed should be raising interest rate when the momentum of inflation is coming down, coming down, and coming down. Let's look at that inflation graph again. This blue line is the same graph. So let me go back. So this is the inflation. The blue line is the same blue line as that one. But I overlaid it with the red line, which is people's wage growth. So let's go to the beginning of this graph, which is 2019. Again, pre-COVID, normal conditions. Normally in America, wages rise above consumer price inflation. So people's standard of living generally rises. Year after year, on average, people's standard of living rises. Then I put that in the middle, green box. That green box is not only about the Federal Reserve going all in, the US federal government went all in to say stimulus check, stimulus check, stimulus check. One of the things that NAR sure was that, well, with everything shut down, we wanted to make sure that unemployment insurance, which typically would not be available for independent contractors, would be available since everything is shut down. So hopefully some of you were able to tap into that resource during that difficulty during the lockdown. But there were a lot of stimulus in many fashions. So in essence, what happened was that people had more income, the red line, compared to inflation, and people spent that money, spent that money, and eventually the blue line or inflation popped higher. And it was rising above the red line, meaning that our standard of living on average were falling and falling for the past two years. So someone working at a service industry say working at a hotel, making 3% or 4% additional wages, it meant nothing because inflation rate was much running much higher, people's standard of living were falling. 
But as you can see on the most recent data point, we're now seeing a crossover point where wages are now above inflation. So inflation definitely trending in the right direction. Now let's look at the key items as to what is driving the inflation or calming the inflation. Let's start from the very bottom. So gasoline prices, as you know, you go to gas station, it is not a happy time, but you know that it is a little lower now than before. So compared to one year ago, maybe you were, you know, topping out at hundred dollars, you know, filling your gas tank, but now maybe it is $80 in filling your gas tank. So $80 is not fun. I mean, because pre COVID, it may have been $50, but at least it is below one year ago levels. Airfare is also lower, even though there's a lot of frustration with airline delays because of the worker shortage conditions. Medical service, really no change. Clothes, little expensive. New cars are 4% more expensive. Electricity, people who are running property management or say commercial real estate. Well, electricity bills are rising at 5.4%. Food prices still refuse to calm down. It is still up 5.8% from one year ago. But the big one is the rents. According to the government, rents are rising at 8% from one year ago. So if you are a real estate investor, you say, well, I'm doing pretty good. I can raise rents. Not only that, home prices are much higher. I did very well. But the rent data is somewhat strange because all indication is that rents are not rising this fast in the private sector information. Government is saying it's rising at 8%. Maybe you agree, maybe you disagree, but on average, rents are rising at about 8% from one year before. One of the big notable items that's rising very fast is car insurance, 17%. We're all driving the same, I think. You know, there's always little risky drivers, others are safe drivers, but what explains for this high car insurance rate? Well, what I can say is that here in Washington, D.C., there is much more increased incidence of automobile vandalism. People are stealing car uh, tires, but smashing windows, car windows to grab whatever is inside. So there's large increased frequency of that. It's happening in many big cities. San Francisco, things are apparently getting out of control in San Francisco. So even though you may not be vandalized, your car is safe, but well, you're still paying for it in terms of higher car insurance. Uh, so as business people, we all know there's no free activity, free lunch, uh, and therefore increased vandalism is really leading to this increased car insurance. So if we can reduce vandalism, one can say inflation will be even calmer. If inflation is calmer, you can say Federal Reserve does not have to raise interest rate. And if they don't have to raise interest rate, mortgage rate will be a little bit lower. Uh, but right now, related to all the pricing situation, gasoline prices is a little lower, but the rents a big heavyweight uh, is still rising at 8%. Now let's go to the rent data a little more carefully. So this is the rent trend from year 2000. So typically rents re rises about three or 4% each year. Uh, during the subprime lending crisis, foreclosure crisis, rents actually did not increase. But in general, three or 4% each year. Then you see towards the end, huge increase in rent that has occurred. But the last data point is showing possible turning, meaning that it's no longer rising more aggressively. Maybe it will increase, but less aggressive than before. Rents are important because in the consumer price inflation equation, it is a heavyweight. How the rents move will really determine the direction of the overall CPI, overall consumer price inflation. Last year or early part of this year, price of eggs. Good discussion item at a dinner table. But it had virtually no impact on overall consumer price inflation because it's less than 1% of our budget in terms of buying uh, eggs. But when you are looking at the rents, uh, it's about one third of our budget. Now, many of you are homeowners. Home prices are not part of the consumer price inflation. 
Stock prices are not part of consumer price inflation. Gold prices, home, gold, stock prices are considered as an asset. So it's not part of the consumer prices. So what they do for homeowners is that they assume that if you are renting out your own home, what would you pay? And they say, well, you're probably paying the same rents as uh, the renters would pay in terms of percent change. So the direction of the rents are also applied to homeowners. So again, big weight to the consumer price inflation. So it's beginning to possibly show signs of deceleration. And I think those trends will continue for the simple fact that apartment construction are very robust and active. Whether it's in big cities like Phoenix, LA, or mid-sized town like Omaha, which I visited earlier part of this year, construction crane. And I asked people, what are they building? They're saying they're building apartments. So apartment construction today are at a 40 year high. I cannot visibly say what's happening in Flagstaff. You know better than I do. But right now, apartment construction are at 40 year high, which means that so many new empty units will be reaching the marketplace in the upcoming months and going into next year. So with so much supply coming onto the market, what well, they cannot raise rents. Just large supply, increased vacancy. So uh, the rent should not be rising in the upcoming months. So rents will surely calm down, which means that it's gonna help the overall consumer prices to calm down and thereby change the monetary policy from tightening to possibly even cutting interest rates next year. So there's a good prospect of cutting interest rates next year if the rents begin to calm down. For homeowners, again, they just look at the rent trend and they would apply the same for the homeowners to say if as if homeowners were paying uh, rents. So many empty units ready to hit the marketplace. Some of you who are real estate investors, because I know the realtors, uh, they don't save on 401k. They save their money on rental properties, and it's been good. High rents, high home prices, it's been good. Uh, but just be mindful that the rent growth in the next few years may be much more difficult with so much apartment construction that is happening. Private sector data, not government data, and just looking at apartments, not single family homes. So just looking at apartments, this is the actual trend on the rents. So according to private sector, they are saying rents are actually rising by only 2% right now. So government data is saying 8%, which includes single family rentals, while the private sector is saying apartment rents are only rising at 2%. So it's just inevitable that the rents will be coming down because private sector data is already indicating as such and so much apartment construction that is happening across the country. Let me now turn to the home sales market. Your commission income is dependent upon that. So let's see what it looks like. In the middle, I put pre-COVID, post-COVID separation. So that's March, 2020. Pre-COVID, home sales were very stable. Little increase, little decrease, no meaningful changes. Then post-COVID, or since the ugly virus came to the country, big swings. During the lockdown, everything fell apart. So people are not outside, you cannot get any deals done. But once the economy reopened, by the way, Arizona was one of the first states to reopen its economy. People wanted to buy home, buy home, buy home because of low interest rates. And also second reason, when there is a virus, people want to get away from big cities. During the great, uh, the, the last virus, you know, a little before Christopher Columbus time out in Europe, uh, Black Death, that killed one third of the European population because of the virus. So what did people do? They said, I'm going to the countryside. People left Rome, went to the mountains, went to the countryside to get away from other people. So we saw that trend here uh, in America as well. When the virus came, people said, I'm getting out of New York City, I'm getting out of LA. So even uh, you know, moving away from Phoenix. So you may have seen people from big cities arriving into Flagstaff or out in the surrounding area 
uh, just to get away from the virus. But anyway, low interest rate and trying to get away from COVID really elevated home sales. Boom, boom time in second half of 2020 and most of 2021. But towards the end, look what's happening. Sales are falling, falling, falling. Maybe it is no longer consistently falling. It's trying to stabilize. But it is stabilizing at a level that is much below pre-COVID. In fact, it is about 20% below pre-COVID activity. So your income potential is about 20% lower now compared to pre-COVID. There was a boom, but now things are a little down. Contrast this with the home builders. The line in the middle is the same, pre-COVID, post-COVID. But if you look at the recent data, builders are doing well. They're back to pre-COVID days. So people who are working in the home building, whether contractors, uh, uh, you, you know, construction workers, they're saying they're pretty much back to pre-COVID days. So what could explain for the fact that in a very similar industry, home building, as well as home sales, why are the home builders doing fine? In fact, for some of the publicly listed home builder companies like KB Homes, Lennar, uh, Toll Brothers, their stock prices have doubled in the past year, about doubled in the past year. So they're doing very good, making profit. So what explains for the fact that the builders are doing well while the realtors are still down in terms of home sales activity? And the best illustration is the following chart. Inventory. On the left-hand side is inventory that is showing up on the MLS. Historically low level conditions. Maybe there's a little fluctuation month to month, but essentially at a historically low condition. Not enough homes for sale, and therefore you cannot get the sales done if there are not enough homes for sale. Well, for the builders, they build those empty homes. They build it as an inventory, and inventory by their standards, home builder standards, is on the upper end, a little higher than normal, so they can get the deals done. So let me go back to what I have said already. I mentioned that home sales have been falling because of higher mortgage rates. But this chart is showing it's not only mortgage rates. There is a second important factor that's driving up home sales, and that is inventory availability. If inventory is not there, you cannot get the sales done. So we need to get more inventory. Now, some of the building activity will eventually show up on MLS, maybe two years from now, three years from now, or even some of uh, uh, today. Uh, you know, hopefully the builders are still paying realtors commission income when they bring clients. Uh, but uh, someone who bought a new home, maybe five years from now, they wanna trade up or move out. So that becomes existing home inventory, but it takes time. And also conversion of some empty disused commercial building whether shopping mall or office spaces, you wanna convert it into residential units, that's gonna take time. So right now, NAR is advocating here in Washington, talking to members of Congress, congressional staff, there's actually a re legislation that is in place. We're just trying to see what is the right uh, overall bigger bill to attach to. So what we are asking Congress right now and hopefully it gets passed. No guarantee, no guarantee, but we are uh, you know, constantly in communication. And thank you for people who contribute, participate in our PAC, uh, which you know, makes the communication much easier. Because in a democracy, politician needs money for their campaign. Uh, and when you provide some uh, campaign money, they're more willing to talk to you. Uh, any quid pro quo would be corruption, uh, illegal, but at least just talking, uh, it opens up so they're at least willing to listen. But anyway, what we're asking is the following. Is there a way to boost inventory right away? And there is a two possibility. One is lower the capital gains tax on an investor sale to a home owner. So say first time buyer, or maybe first generation buyer, or put income limitation about who the buyer would be. 
But there are many real estate investors who have accumulated large wealth. And maybe if there's a tax incentive to sell, maybe they would be willing to do so. In fact, there are 20 million single family rentals owned by mom and pop, meaning that uh, it could be realtor, you know, who are owning two, three, five properties. Maybe they would be willing to unload one or two of those property if the tax incentive is right. So just temporarily, lower capital gains tax on a sale of those investor property homes. So it reaches the market and there's a possibility of getting it to the first time buyer. So we are asking for that. Uh, let's see how it moves. Uh, you know, just be patient on, on this. Uh, but we are working hard in Washington to move this, communicate this message. Uh, the second uh, way to increase inventory is the following. Price of eggs is expensive. Price of new car is expensive. But did you know that when you sell a home as an owner occupant, not an investor sale, as an owner occupant, when you sell your home, generally you don't pay tax, capital gains tax, and you use the proceeds to buy next home. But home prices have risen so much in places like Arizona, many people are suddenly realizing if they sell their home, it surpasses the exemption amount. 250000 for a single person, half a million dollars for a couple. So if you sell a home and say your capital gains tax is 600000 then now you have to pay tax and they change their minds. Oh, I don't want to sell my home now because I don't want to pay that tax. Uh, but since price of everything has risen, maybe this exemption level, which has been unchanged for almost 25 years, price of everything is rising. Why don't we just uh, index, the, index the exemption level to the consumer price inflation? So just to say that everything is rising, so why don't we also raise the exemption amount uh, so that now people would not be hit with the capital gains tax uh, among the owner occupant sales, uh, even after the exemption. So those two legislation, again, we're talking to Congress to see if we can bring immediate inventory onto the marketplace. Now let's turn to the home prices. Home sales are low, but prices are not really falling. I know in Phoenix it's down about 10%. San Francisco is down about 15%. But believe it or not, that it's only the West region that is experiencing price declines. You go to the Midwest, Southern states, prices are pretty much holding on, but prices are down about 10% in Phoenix, but that's after about 40, 50% growth during the COVID years. So 40% increase minus 10, that's not that painful. In fact, people say, oh, yeah, well, no big deal. Uh, other than people who recently purchased, maybe it's a big deal for them. So prices incredibly are holding on in most parts of the country because of lack of inventory. And I'm sure you still have some multiple offers still happening because even though the sales are down, because of the limited inventory, new property shows up, and what do you know? Three, four people are making a bid. Escalation clause. In the latest data, one third of homes that are sold are sold above the original list price because of the multiple offers. So home prices remaining firm. And in fact, if we look at the Flagstaff home prices, according to the government, government this is not a median price. This is something called repeat price index. I don't want to go into the equation part, but there is a fancy equation, which in essence, try to control for quality to say that for the same home, if it was being sold again, did it experience an appreciation or depreciation? And what you see on this chart from year 2000 is that during the subprime lending days, it went up. Then we had the foreclosure crisis and we had a price reduction. Through that price reduction period, I think cumulatively prices declined about 30%. But look at the COVID time, huge price increase. And now people are saying, are we going to face some similar price decline after the big increase? And answer is, well, let me put it this way. Let me give you the factual background and you can then make your own assessment. Factual background is first, we don't have those shoddy subprime lending anymore. People showed up, they didn't even declare their income and they got a mortgage. Fake mortgage with you know, a teaser interest rate, which then blew up 
Uh, so fortunately, we don't have those mortgages. Second difference is that we don't have foreclosure crisis. In fact, we have minimal foreclosures in the marketplace, only about 2% of all transactions. So, and those foreclosures are quickly being absorbed in the marketplace. So with limited inventory and no subprime lending, the factual background is fundamentally different now compared to uh, when the prices blew up back in 2010. So I would not be too concerned about the prices. But as you can see, at least through the first quarter, government is saying that the prices in Flagstaff were still about three or 4% above one year ago. Since Phoenix is down about 10%, usually Flagstaff would follow that trend, uh, but maybe with the temperature in Phoenix getting out of hand, super hot, maybe more people will seek out, especially among the wealthier one, seek out a second property to cool off in the summertime out in Flagstaff. So maybe you get that extra demand uh, that is not present in Phoenix, but you begin to see those impact additional demand showing up in Flagstaff. Uh, I think I one time drove from Las Vegas, not to Flagstaff, but to um, the lake, uh, trying to remember the lake nearby, Lake Havasu. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I could easily imagine some people from uh, Las Vegas wanting to buy either in Lake Havasu or even in Flagstaff. But yeah, Lake Havasu is also hot. Maybe Flagstaff is a better choice. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, some extreme hot weather uh, uh, impact could begin to uh, migrate people into more uh, temperate areas or at least in the evening where things could cool down. I'm very surprised. You go down to 60 degrees tonight, you can open the window. I cannot do that here in Washington. Humid, 75 in the evening, we never cool off and then it becomes hot again. Let me turn to the job market. This is how many people in America are receiving steady income? Realtors don't receive steady income. Your income fluctuates. But among people who are receiving W-2 statement salary, W-2 statement salary, this is the figure. Right before COVID, then we had a lockdown. But since the lifting of the lockdown, with each passing month, more job, more job, more job, such that today we have 4 million more Americans working, receiving W-2 statement salary compared to pre-COVID. Let me take five second break because I need to drink something. So I think I have uh, something here. So job market steadily improving. But not all states are equal. Here's the US map. When you see a red color or peach color, it's not good. New York, I was in upstate New York yesterday talking and I said, look, New York, you are falling behind. You are showing minus 0.5% in New York, which means that New York has not fully recovered those job losses from COVID. But if you go to Arizona, People in the back cannot see the figures, so let me read off the figure to you. 6.0% in Arizona, meaning that there are 6% more people working now compared to record high employment pre-COVID. 6% more. W-2 statement jobs. Who are the outstanding performers? Texas, Florida, and then a couple of Rocky Mountain states, Idaho, Nevada, uh, Utah. But Arizona is clearly one of the top performers in the country. So congratulations, 6% more jobs in Arizona. If we look at specifically in the Flagstaff metro market, the job market, W-2 statement payroll jobs, looks like, looks like the following. So back in the year 2000, essentially 20 years ago, 23 years ago, there were 55,000 people working in your area. Then right before COVID, there were 70,000 people working. Then COVID knocked people away. But since then, you have fully recovered. Little, uh, essentially, you know, slightly above pre-COVID condition in Flagstaff. So you have recovered all those job losses. But let me show you this. Look at this Phoenix. You know that Phoenix has become super big. But back in the year 2000, there are only about one and a half million people working in Phoenix. 
Today, there are about 2.4 million. That is a 600,000, 700,000 more people working in the Phoenix region in the past 20 years. 700,000, that is a massive number of people working or having moved to the region. But with temperature being so hot, you have to wonder how many of the wealthier people in the Phoenix metro market may want a place. They still want to have a primary home in Phoenix, but maybe they want a little cooler condition out in Flagstaff for the summer. So good possibility of regarding your market because of the strong job market condition in your state. Let me now go into the mortgage rate because a big factor for many things. So mortgage rate pre-COVID was around 4%. Then we had the real estate boom because of low interest rates in 2020, 2021. 2022 last year, second half was really bad. First half, not so much. First half was decent. Second half of last year was bad because of rising mortgage rates. But this year, it looks like mortgage rate will be higher on average compared to last year. Right now, today is about 7%, close to 7%. But if the mortgage rate decline in the second half of the year and actually decline even further to around 6% by next year, then this will really make the housing market move better. Not only is that about the buyers, more buyer potential, but also sellers. You know the reason why sellers don't want to move. They love their 3% rate. But if they have to move because of life-changing circumstance, additional child in the family, marriage, divorce, death in the family, or job in a different location, all this would drive home sales. But now they are not moving because they love their 3% mortgage rates. But this pent-up selling, I think, is steadily building. So at some point, there was a heck with it. I have to move. I need a larger size home. So even at higher mortgage rate, they would be willing to sell. But if the interest rates are a little bit lower, the cost, the financial cost of that move is less painful. So as the interest rate decline, you will get more buyers and more sellers. So really benefiting uh, the real estate market condition. So if the mortgage rate forecast, as I put, plays out, then it's going to be very good news for you. And in fact, if that was to play out, again, if condition before I will show you why I think mortgage rate will really decline. But if the mortgage rate decline, my home sales forecast looks like the following. The blue is home builders. So still home builders uh, activity is you know, smaller compared to the MLS transactions. So this year is still a downer compared to last year because of the awful first half. Maybe the second half will be a little better. Uh, but next year will definitely uh, be an improvement if mortgage rate decline. Falling mortgage rates helps buyers and helps sellers. If we have a legislation on getting that more immediate inventory from capital gains tax relief on real estate investor sales, temporary uh, tax uh, reduction, or raising the exemption level, owner occupant, you sell a home, you know, half a million dollar for a couple, you index it to inflation so it's a little higher, then you will have more inventory. So if we get more inventory along with lower interest rates, better activity next year. So why do I believe mortgage rate will decline? So here is the reason. No one can be uh, perfect in their forecast. One can only make some logical conclusion, and this is my logic. First point, rents will calm down. Apartment construction is heavy. Massive apartment construction. Since rent is a big component to the consumer price inflation, overall consumer price inflation will calm down and therefore will make the Federal Reserve stop raising interest rate after next week. With the possibility of cutting interest rate next year or even in December, and the Wall Street will go wild and they will readjust and mortgage rate will quickly come down. So robust apartment construction, common rents will make mortgage rate a little lower. Second reason, do you remember the Silicon Valley Bank? 
uh, and then there was another bank in New York, and then another First Republic that was you know, very shaky before a large bank took over. Believe it or not, there are many community banks in similar situation, except right now they are given little life preserver temporarily. Federal Reserve set up a new credit facility to say, okay, we're going to provide a little help. This help, if it existed before the fall of the Silicon Valley Bank, Silicon Valley Bank would not have fallen. So without going into the mechanics of it, there are many community banks still suffering. And why are they suffering? Because of unexpected fast increase in interest rates by the Federal Reserve. Big banks are not suffering, but the small size banks are suffering. Consider small size bank, you lend it for commercial real estate, you know, a couple of years ago, and you are getting an interest rate return of 4%. But today you have to pay depositors 5%. What kind of business is that? Pay depositors 5%, but get 4% return? You know, that's, that's not a good model. Many community banks are in this situation. But why come the big banks are not in this situation? What do you know? Big banks were, in a sense, tipped off. Or maybe that's not a good word because it can raise a conspiracy theory. I don't want to create conspiracy. But the big banks have to undergo something called stress test analysis regularly with the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve visits the big bank and they said, if we were to raise interest rate this much, how is your balance sheet? And if the balance sheet is not good, then the Federal Reserve will say, well, make sure your balance sheet is good once we raise the interest rate to meet the stress test. So in a sense, big banks had to undergo stress tests to assure that they would be in fine shape if the interest rates were increased. Small banks, they did not have stress tests, and it, they were taken completely by surprise on the interest rate policy. So given that community banks are suffering, which is a bad economic news, but from interest rate policy, I think the Federal Reserve is clearly aware of this. So they do not want to cause further harm to the federal uh, community banks. And therefore, they are saying, OK, should we raise interest rate two more times? But every time they raise it, it's causing more financial stress to the community bank. And I don't think they want to do that. So therefore, I think the, given that the community banks are suffering, uh, there is a reason the Federal Reserve should not be or will not be aggressively raising interest rate further after next week. The final point is the following. Spread with a government bond. As you know, government is running a large budget deficit, so government has to borrow money. When they borrow money, they have to pay interest. But it's the safest asset in the world, so U.S. government pays fairly low interest rate on their borrowing. Currently, on their 10-year Treasury yield, it is around 3.8% today, 3.8%. And if you look at the mortgage rates, most mortgages in America have government guarantee. Veterans, we thank them for their service, and there's a Veterans Affairs Mortgage. I know trying to get it done, deal done can be a little complicated or long delays, but at least it has government guarantee. FHA. Government guarantee, important for first-time buyers. Mortgages originated by Bank of America or other lenders generally get sold to Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie government guarantee. So what does this mean about government guarantee? That means if the borrowers cannot pay, whoever provided the loan do not have to worry because government will pay that. So as a Wall Street investors or teachers pension fund, say Arizona teachers pension fund, you say, where, where do they invest the money? They can invest some amount in the stock market, but maybe they want to diversify and have something in the uh, U.S. government bond. But the U.S. government bond provides only 3.8% return. If they were to buy mortgages with government guarantee, it would provide safe return. That's why whatever government borrowing rate is, generally the mortgage rate would be two percentage point higher. If you look at the historical graph, government borrows at 5%, mortgage rate is 7%. Government borrows at 3%, mortgage rate will be two percentage point above. So 3% plus two would be five. So let's go back to today, government borrowing rate. Government borrowing rate today is 3.8%. 
plus two would imply mortgage rate under normal circumstance would be 5.8%. Government 3.8 plus two equals 5.8%. So mortgage rate today should be already at 5.8%, but that is not the case. It's closer to 7%. So we are at this abnormal condition. But good thing, abnormal, abnormal, how can I say it? Abnormality. Abnormality means it will not stay abnormal for a long time. It will return to normal. And you look at all the past incidents. Anytime there was an abnormality, after about six to eight months or sometimes a little longer one year that abnormality disappears so this widespread between mortgage and government bond very widespread i think will steadily narrow and that will bring down the mortgage rates so let me repeat three conditions rents coming down the federal reserve is aware of the community banks and third the spread between the government bond and the mortgage rate will steadily narrow and therefore mortgage rate decline. Mortgage rate decline is going to steadily help the housing market, more home buyers and more home sellers. So thank you very much for inviting me to share some of my uh, thoughts with you all. Of course, not all forecasts can be perfect. Uh, but this is how I see the market condition and hopefully it plays out. So just hold on for a few extra months and I think things will be improving for the better uh, later this year and going into next year. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Lawrence? Questions for Lawrence while we have him for a couple of minutes? If you do, please come up to the mic. Not all at once. Lawrence, we have a question. I, I know you said earlier that you would be voicing your displeasure uh, if they, uh, oh, if, uh, God, I'm drawing, I'm drawing a blank, I apologize. Um, why, I, I'm talking about why the Fed would, uh, bump it another 25 basis points or more, which is widely expected, I believe. So you said if it's down around 3% inflation right now, why on earth would they do that? So I'm, I'm wondering if you would just comment one more time on what would their reason possibly be? Do they want it to be a 2% inflation rate, 1%? Thank you. Uh, very good question. So the idea of inflation, they consider it to be 2%. So it's getting there, but we have to remember Econ 101 textbook says that anytime there's a monetary policy change, the impact shows up with a lag time, which means that uh, the impact will show up much later uh, the condition, you know, higher interest rate, how the business spending is falling. In fact, you know, the big factories, whether Intel and others, their business spending is a little lower now than before because of the higher interest rate conditions. So they're really holding back the economy. And as I, uh, I think, wrote in one of the real term magazine column, you know, some, you know, I think many of you all received that. Like Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player, always said, you pass the puck not to where the player is today, where he is right now, but where the player will be. So I think the Fed has to adopt a similar policy. They have to say inflation today is 3%. But what would be the inflation in the future? What will it be in the future? And inflation will clearly be at 2% or lower in the future. So there's no reason to raise hikes. But if they do, I think they will recognize later, so quickly, hopefully, it was a mistake. So which means that they will be cutting interest rate again early next year or possibly before the year finishes. All right, Lawrence, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you.